in the Christian faith, we have at the center of our faith, we have absolute core definitional beliefs at the center of our faith. They define the faith. Every Christian must believe these particular things. Okay? And then outside of those, we have the next set of beliefs that are extremely important. They're so closely related that a denial of any one of these would probably indicate a fundamental misunderstanding of something in the center, but they're not the definitional doctrines. They are very important. Uh, it's great clarity but not as much centrality as what you have in the center. These are concentric circles. And so then you have the next set outside of that. And obviously we can just keep on going here. How many of these you want? And obviously there are going to be disagreements between people as to exactly what doctrine fits in what circle. But what happens eventually, what happens eventually is that you get to a range out here that would be called the adiaphora. What does adiaphora mean? The things that do not make a difference. They aren't definitional. Um, and they should be things upon which Christians are able to extend freedom about and to have differences of opinion. Now, we all know that what happens is we get out here and, you know, your tradition, your experience, your upbringing tells you that there's things in here that are really actually in the second level. And so you're extremely um, reluctant to extend any kind of allowance for disagreement. And of course, one of the most important things, this is really important to think about. You will hear all the time people talking about gospel issues. What is a gospel issue? Let me, let me give you an example. Uh, I will be uh, preaching on God's law in regards to uh, God's creative decree regarding human sexuality at Apologia Church on January 16th in solidarity with our Canadian brothers because that'll be the first Sunday where it is literally illegal in Canada uh, to uh, say anything negatively in regards to sexual orientation, all the rest of that kind of stuff. And so I have said for decades that is a gospel issue. Now, many people say, no, 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 no. Jesus never said anything about it. So how could it be a gospel issue? And my response has been, because you have to be able to define what sin is to be able to explain the very necessity and nature of the gospel. Why does Christ have to die on a cross? Why does he have to give his life? Because God's law has been broken. And so a substitute is needed. The breaking of God's law is what drives this, you see. And so if you can't define what sin is, and the Bible clearly defines homosexuality as a violation of God's law, then you have no way of defining the gospel. So that is a gospel issue. And so it's not out here in the adiaphora, but independent fundamentalist Baptists, for example, have no adiaphora. Everything is a gospel issue. All these circles are just one circle. It's just, we draw a solid circle here and you gotta be in there and outside there's nothing. Well, that means everything is a gospel issue. Now what we have to think about is lines that go inward and lines that go outward. What do I mean by that? When you have a central doctrine that then has 
not just implications, but necessary application going outward. That's what makes it a gospel issue. If you don't believe this, you can no longer believe what's in here. But the line doesn't necessarily go the other direction. Everybody wants to have a Christian worldview that will make all of this consistent with our Christian confession. We want to do that. But we have to be very careful to think clearly about which direction the line is going. So, eschatology. There, I have brothers who believe in pretty much all of the orthodox eschatologies. Now, I see that here. You better believe that if I'm trying to be consistent here, it's going to have an impact on my eschatology. But are you going to make it a gospel issue to say, if you don't agree with my eschatology, that means you are not saved? That's what the Independent Fundamentalist Baptists do. But hopefully we all recognize most of them have no earthly idea what any of the other views are. It's just, just arrogance based upon ignorance. You've heard it over and over again. So I want to have a Christian worldview that's going to hold all this stuff together. But when I do, I recognize I need to extend grace to others who will have a different emphasis. And very frequently that emphasis will be found in what each of these inner lines are all about. Where you're placing, you know, this one's a little bit farther out than this one, and some, well, no, I think that doctrine, that's where a lot of this is coming from, is from the differing emphases that we have. This is from Mueller. There's a discussion under the, the it's 6.1, natural and supernatural theology. Uh, the problem of natural theology and the reformers. This massive work is on the development of reformed orthodoxy from the time of the Reformation through to the modern period. And so there's all sorts of things that go into that. The context of the early orthodox writers was different from that of the reformers. Why? Whereas Calvin arguably understood the debate over reason, natural revelation, and philosophy as a battle against the causes of excesses and mistakes of what? In the theology of the later Middle Ages. Keckerman, Alstead, and their contemporaries surely saw the issue in the context of the establishment of a Protestant Reformed theology in the institutional context of academies and universities, specifically the academies and universities in lands where the Reformation had been successful and the abuses for the most part set aside. And certainly the institutionalization of reform thought implied the appropriation in a more thorough and overt manner of the best of the older Christian tradition, both patristic and medieval. In brief, we shall be able here, as on the other topics investigated, to identify continuities and discontinuities in the development of the reform teaching. Here's the issue. Calvin is in a different battle. He is in the battle with Rome, primarily. But... He's also battling on the issues of God's sovereignty, divine election. He's battling with Servetus on the Trinity. And this is reflected in the what? <clears throat> what was the term we were looking at before we got sidetracked there? The emphases that he would bring to this same diagram. The emphases he would have. Vitally important. And the later Reformed, are all of a sudden developing this interest in these other things because now, well, they're in academic settings. And unlike Calvin, who knew that if he traveled alone, he was in grave danger of being killed by Roman Catholic assassins, but also Protestant assassins for that matter. He knew he was in grave danger. That tends to focus your theology. But now when the only thing you have to worry about uh, is getting your papers graded in the academic setting, all of a sudden your attention can wander to other things and it's going to impact 
your emphasis. And that's what we've got here. That's what ends up uh, doing these things. Now, so let's start off with monotheism, okay? There is only one true God. If you're going to make that affirmation, there are certain inevitable things that flow from this. If there is only one true God and he is the creator of all things, all right, then to believe both of these will inevitably require you to believe that God is, for example, eternal. Because there's only one God, he's the creator of all things, so anything that exists comes from him. And so these beliefs have necessary implications. Let's try one belief that unfortunately uh, a lot of Christians sort of struggle with. And let me show you how this works. Let's take monotheism. Let's take the deity of the Son. I didn't say deity of Christ just because Christ is normally in reference to his incarnate state. He's, of course, deity in his incarnate state as well, but he was deity before then as well. Deity of the Son. Let's take incarnation. The word became flesh. And let's take a resurrection. Not general resurrection, but the resurrection of Christ specifically, the reality of that. Now, if we believe all these things and we bring them in close proximity with one another, can we ignore the implications that each has for the other? I don't believe so. And when you look at what has happened in the history of the church, what has happened is when you affirm all of these things, a true incarnation. Jesus truly took on a physical nature. Um, he's truly died and was truly raised again, bodily from the dead. He's truly God, truly man. There's only one God. And the result of this is the foundation of what leads to epistatic union, that Christ is one person with two natures. They are not separated from one another, Nestorianism. You do not take out a part of the human nature, or replace it with the divine, Apollinarianism. That's where Bill Craig is. You do not mix them together so he's half man, half God. That's Eutychianism. Two natures, not intermingled, but in one person, together, hypostatic union. That term is found nowhere in Scripture. Here's the question. That this is what I want us to think about today. And that is, what authority, what is the authority link here? What is the authority of a belief like this? And we as non-Roman Catholics and non-Eastern Orthodox, and even they would have differences to exactly what this is, we have to explain why we would identify a denial of this as a heresy. In light of, of course, sola scriptura. And many people say you can't. Because if they understand sola scriptura in a certain way, it just simply has to be laying there on the, on the page and it, it, you know, it has to be a chapter and a verse and that's all you can do. What I'm asking us to think about, to struggle with, to think through, if we don't think through it, in the context of faith, then someone else can come along and require us to think through it in the context of unbelief. And the better time is now than it is later on. <laughs> Now's the time to, to think through these things. These are biblical. 
These are directly found in the pages of Scripture. If I did the Doctrine of the Trinity up here, I'd have monotheism. I'd have the, the three divine persons. I'd have the equality of the persons, and that, that results in the Doctrine of the Trinity. And it's believing these things that leads to this. Okay? So, is this biblical? And how far can we go from here if we keep going upward? How far can you go and still call it biblical? Well, obviously, one, one test is, is this truly necessary to confess these things. I would say in this case, it most certainly is. That's where it comes from. I mean, you could put some more boxes down there if you wanted to add a few things to it just to round it out. But yes, yes. Let's think about another term that you may not have heard of as often. Perichoresis. Perichoresis. Now, if I were to be a betting man, um, I'm not sure what percentage of healthy, committed uh, Christians who actually read books on the faith and everything. I'm not sure what percentage of people would actually know what that term is. But it'd be a fairly small percentage. And yet there would be some who say, without this, you can't have a thoroughly biblical understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. Hmm. Well, what does it mean? It means the complete interpenetration of the divine persons with one another. And if you were to just explain it, sort of, it would be if in the confession of the Trinity... We say that Father, Son, and Spirit are fully God and share fully, fully, the divine being, the being of God. That's the orthodox understanding. Each of the divine persons are fully God, share fully the being of God. If that is the case, then this flows from that because if there is not complete interpenetration of the divine persons, that would mean that there is some aspect of the being of God that one of the divine persons does not share. So this flows from and is the inevitable result of confessing these things. And why would you confess those things? Well, maybe due to the fact that, for example, each of the divine persons is identified as Yahweh. <laughs> that would be a really good, solid foundation for doing that. But you see the interconnectedness. You see that what you're fundamentally doing is um, there is such a thing as a negative statement theology. And many of our statements of theology are not a positive God is this, but a negative God isn't that. And part of that is simply due to the fact that when you're talking about a God who is outside of time, he's the Alpha and Omega, he's the beginning and the end, he's with the first, he was the last, we can't even start to necessarily... Uh, wrap our little creaturely minds about the, around these things and we are dependent upon divine revelation for so many things. And so because of that, we always have to be humble. And this, of course, just a brief reminder in passing, we've said it many, many, many times before, but that uh, theologian from Geneva, I think was very, very, very wise to say that we should make an end of speaking when God makes an end of speaking. Well, how do you do that? Is confessing this, the hypostatic union, a violation of the wisdom that Calvin gave us in those words? I don't believe it is, and I don't believe he would have said that it was. But eventually, 
we do have to deal with the reality that God has made an end of speaking. There are questions that can be asked that either cannot be answered um, in a directly biblical fashion or we just have to be honest in saying that is a question that takes us into the realm of speculation. Into the realm of speculation. What has happened down through the centuries is where that line is and needs to be drawn is a matter of debate. And the reality is even today, even in the Reformed community, you have people teaching in broadly uh, Reformed contexts that have different emphases. And once you get past a certain point, so let's say, let's say we have a light source here, all right? It's a little bit like scripture. Scripture sheds light, defines truths, gives us things that we need to know about God. But to the dismay of many, there is an end point. Now, exactly where that end point is is going to depend a little bit on different people who have different views. But you get to a, a, a place out here where things start getting fuzzy, all right? And once you go past that, once you get past this area, then what you're basically dealing with is, is once you go out here, what do you have? What do we call that out there? Well, we would want to argue, we would want to argue that well, as long as I'm being consistent here and I'm trying to make proper applications and we looked at the hypostatic union, you can look at perichoresis and there are things you can do. Y you want to argue that based on divine revelation, I want to be consistent as I go here, but eventually I get to a point where this is speculation. That's all it is. Once you get past that certain point. But... Roman Catholics and Orthodox have a way around this. And I'm afraid more and more Protestants are starting to buy into having this extra little thing. And what I mean by that is there are those who would say, well, yeah, if, if all you have is scripture, then yeah, that, that, that's all you, you end up with. There we go. But there's, there's something more to be had, you see. There's something more to be had because once you get out here, then what you can have is, change this over so that, oh, sorry. There we go, highlighter. What you, can, what you can do once you run out of scripture out here, you can get tradition. You can call it the great tradition if you want. You can call it whatever you want, but we've got tradition out here. And so here's tradition. And it, it functions as a lens to refocus the light from Scripture so that we can go farther out to here and we can get all sorts of stuff out here that we can now call divine truth that the writers of Scripture back here never would have dreamed of, never even thought of it. Now, some of the more obvious examples of things like this, we in the West are primarily familiar with the Roman Catholic uh, traditions that have been defined. And over since the 1870s, uh, the things that have been defined on the base of well, 1850s uh, have been the... Um, Exception, papal infallibility, bodily assumption of Mary. These have all been defined on the basis of tradition uh, since the 1850s. And these are dogmas. And so this is, what, this is what tradition ostensibly gives you. Now, the reformers said no. Um, 
they lived in a day when this was one of the primary arguments against their gospel preaching. And so they emphasized the sufficiency of Scripture. But then, if you listened as I was reading from Muller, once things become academic and you've got the institutions and you can travel from city to city without worrying about the other side killing you, all of a sudden, there is an introduction of other sources. And you can start looking at some of this stuff that your predecessors had said no, no, no to. But now you're open to a discussion of these particular things. But you have to bring something else in because there is a limitation as to what Scripture reveals. Now, I would say you could spend your entire life delving into what is in that revelation from God, to be sure. And you would never be, you'd never run out of, of these things. Um, but there is this incredible desire on the part of many people to keep on going. I, I don't like being stopped here, so I want to keep on going. I've got other questions that I want to ask. And that becomes a real issue. It becomes a real issue for all of us. And where you end up coming down on so many of these issues is going to be dependent upon where you believe the tipping point is reached between that which is necessary to confess so as to continue to confess all true biblical revelation and passing by that point into that which either has been confessed by people in the past, and when you ask, why did they confess it? You're just told, well, they did. And so they're part of the great tradition, and therefore we need to too. And I go, why? Is it necessary to be able to do so, to, to say these things, to be faithful to the biblical revelation? And this is really where the big question comes, is, is there an authority after that? We have historically said no. We have pointed to example after example after example where people have erred on this, and there are so many dead ends in the history of the church where scriptural sufficiency was abandoned. And sure, people may have gone with the, the, with the flow for a while. And no one believes that any longer today. They were dead ends. They didn't, went, they didn't go anywhere because it wasn't actually divine truth. Philosophical systems and all sorts of things um, leads to, to that situation.